Join us March 23rd and 24th for the 2019 Meet the Masters of Income property. Let's break this down and look at some of the strengths of income property as an asset class. I found that this event is really helpful because I'm totally a newbie to real estate investment. And so I picked up so much information. One of the great things about it is that it's so fragmented, right? Embrace the fragmentation. Uh, I've actually been learning a lot about the tax benefits to uh, real estate and a lot of, I've been in investing actually well over 10 years now and I learned a lot of new things today. The other advantage of this weekend is networking. Meeting new property managers, meeting new area specialists and, and seeing the product they have to offer, that changes year by year. Register now at jasonhartman.com slash masters. Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe Subscribe to the RSS feed and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. It's my pleasure to welcome Libby Gill to the show. She has quite a resume. She's a former senior executive at media giants like Universal, Sony, Turner Broadcasting, and The Dr. Phil Show. And she is a CEO and business coach on brand strategy. And it's just a pleasure to welcome her to talk about her new book, which launched today, entitled Capture the Mind Share and the Market Share Will Follow, The Art and Science of Building Brands. Libby, welcome. How are you? Thank you, Jason. Delighted to be here. Well, it's great to have you. You're coming to us from Los Angeles today, I believe. I am. I'm looking out at the sunny weather and blue skies right now. Fantastic. Well, tell us a little bit about your book. Congratulations. Today is the launch. Yes, and if we were on video, my office would prove it. It looks like a, a whirlwind went through here today with you know, <laughs> packages coming and going. It's exciting. My book is about... What I did before, I think anybody even called it branding, when I worked in television and the studio world for a long time, I was head of PR and communications for those studios that you mentioned, and sometimes what the, and I always worked on the television side, briefly on the film, but I loved TV, and it was about launching and promoting the shows, but also the studios, some of the divisions, as well as the celebrities and the executives. So it was really about how do you figure out what is the essence of a person or a project that's really going to stand out and get people's attention and get in front of the right audience? Because as much as we'd like to think the whole world should should flock to us, whatever we do, that's generally not the case. And I know you talk about people building a niche within their consulting or their speaking specialty, and I think that's really important. So that's where I started, and all those different aspects of marketing, communications, public relations, advertising as well, you know, you, you put them all together, and those are all the aspects and the elements of branding. So when I left the studio world, I decided to do two things that I really loved, and, and one was the whole idea of the strategy around brands and helping people with that initial step of how do you articulate your gift? What's the differentiator that really makes you just sing? You know, if you're in a sea of people that do what you do, and we're, we both speak and we're out there consulting, and there are lots of people that do those sorts of things. So we have to figure out what, what's the secret sauce that makes us 
who we are and makes people remember us. And the other part of that was the coaching element because I, I dearly loved taking my staff, and I usually at the studios I had the biggest staff of the youngest, greenest kids because public relations just required a lot of time-intensive kind of work. And it was a real joy and passion of mine to, to turn young people and anybody developing a career, and take them to the next level and ultimately turn them into superstars. And that's what I do in my coaching, both with entrepreneurs and executives, is how do you accelerate that path? How do you get where you want to go? How do you really articulate what you're great at so that people really notice, so that they know what the value is? that you bring. Yeah, I think it was Steve Case in an article I read many years ago in possibly Fast Company that wrote about how brands are a form of shorthand. And, you know, it's so important nowadays as we live in this very busy, information-saturated world where so much is coming at us that like you said, Libby, that people can articulate this well and quickly, that they, they become known for something so that they, they have a clear, you know, or their audience or their tribe, as Seth Godin puts it, they have a, a, a clear value proposition for them, I guess, right? Yes, exactly. And and you you don't have much time, obviously, on the Internet. If somebody's shopping, you've got about five seconds to grab their attention. That, that mouse clicks so, pretty fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe three seconds. So if somebody comes to your site or talks to you at a, a networking event or at, at a conference, and they don't get it, they don't understand what you do, how you do it, who you do it for, you've lost them. You've got a little bit more time in person because most people won't you know, turn on the heel and run after five seconds. They might after 30 seconds or a couple of minutes. But online, you've got far less than that. And it's okay if people get you and say, ah, that's not for me. If people come to me and say, and I'm looking for a real estate coach, well, they're going to bounce away from me immediately. They're going to get, that's not what I do, and they're going to run right to you. And that's okay. You know, they'll find us for what we do. And what you want to do is articulate that so clearly that both your your 90-year-old grandma and your 9-year-old nephew are both going to understand what you do. And then, of course, everybody in between, you're going to find that ideal client who's going to say, oh, tell me more. Because that's what you want to hear. Tell me more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's dissect this and drill down on it a little bit if we can. You have seven steps that you talk about. I do. I talk about the seven C's, literally the letter C, starting first with, with clarifying both the vision that you have for your business. I mean, that, that is baseline. You've got to start with, wh- where am I going? What am I doing? And if you can, if you can articulate, where do you want to be in a year? And then back that out. That's a good framework for everyone to start with. But beyond that, you want to clarify your customer benefits. When you talk about your brand, you've got to remember, it's not just about you. And it's very tempting to fill your website and your, all your promotional materials with me, 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 you, you know, my, my pedigree, my technical specs, my background all the initials after my name, whatever you've got. But you've got to remember it's about them. It's about your customer. So you've got to have that clear, compelling language that addresses their interests. So that's the first thing is to clarify. Next, you've got to commit to providing real value. You've got to stand out from the crowd by having both that brand promise, the value proposition that you mentioned, and then delivering on it because people love to talk about branding in terms of all the expressions, you know, your logo, your graphics, your pictures, all those fun things. But you've got to remember that your brand, that's only a piece of it. The rest of your promise is the first step, but the delivery is the most important part of it. So it's that deep commitment to constantly being ready to blow your customers' minds with absolute value, more than they ever expect. And the third C is to connect. You want to remember in the whole chain of events, the, all the touch points that you have, all those interactions that you have with a customer from the first, the, the email that you get through the form on your website or the phone call, and as you move down that chain and you deepen the relationship, that every one of those touch points, those connective points, is a way that you can deepen not just the relationship and the rapport, but the actual value that you give. People will always ask me, well, can I give something away for free? And I say, yeah, you better be giving things away for free. What better way to demonstrate that, you know, here's what you get for free. Imagine what you get if you retain me, if you hire me, if you read my book, if you bring me on board. And that's what that deep emotional connection is about, is is really demonstrating your value. 
then you've got communicate. How do you communicate with a level of confidence? I've got a, uh, an article on my blog. If you go to my blog and scroll down, you'll find this, why confidence is king or queen. And it's really about some of the scientific studies about how people who appear to be confident, you know, the extroverts, or I always tell people, Jason, I'm a, I'm a situational extrovert. I'm just as happy in my office by myself writing away as I am on the platform speaking to 2,000 people. I don't want to do either one all the time, but if you saw me in my office or in my, you know, the, the fact that I've got to sort of psych myself up to go to the, the networking, the VIP cocktail party, because I don't know anybody and I haven't spoken, that's harder than getting up on the platform. But because I, I, I would have to agree, by the way, I would say I'm you a do? situational extrovert, and just like you said. Situational yeah, extrovert. We have a lot and yeah, a there. lot of actors are famous for that. And they, they don't want to talk to anybody, but you put them in front of a camera and they're right at home. But there, we've got to face the fact that the world is set up for extroverts and certainly the workplace. We want people who participate, who have some power, some enthusiasm, and studies will back that up, that people that do that are perceived as more intelligent, as better leaders. They're the ones who get more respect and trust. And so if you don't have those skills naturally, you've got to learn situationally. And I've got a bunch of tips for people on my blog to tell them how they can do that. Because the conclusion of this study, which I just found fascinating, was that it was really that anybody who's hiring, a hiring manager, you've got to look beyond the veneer of confidence and look at the ability. I don't have that much faith in people to look beyond that. So I say, hey, let's take a page from those confident people's playbook and learn how to do what they do, at least in an interview or at a networking event or situationally when we need to step up. And one little hint, I'll tell anybody who's introverted or just hates speaking up at a meeting that I always advise my executives, and I, I coach a lot of senior level folks, and everybody has that moment of ah, shyness, introversion, feeling insecure, is speak, if you're at a big meeting and you know you've got to speak up at some point, you've got to put some kind of idea or perspective on the table, do it in the first 10 minutes because you get it out of the way and you don't sit there stressing for an hour right. waiting for the moment to come as your tension is is building steadily so there are a lot of things we can learn and uh, and that's one of those tricks about how you can communicate of course planning your communication having a a communication protocol before you ever need it is critical and i talk about that a lot in uh, capture the give mind. us a communication protocol tip if you would just any you well, know any miscellaneous yeah, one. one thing you can do and this also speaks to connection is to have a welcome packet have a branded welcome packet for any of your new clients any new customers or your prospects so that they can see when you come on board I've got a process. I'm going to give you all the technical things that you need to know. I'm going to give you all the contact information. I'm going to get, I'll give you all the, the sort of homework, worksheets, anything you need to get started. It, should, it doesn't have to be something that you spend a fortune on, but it should be, whether it's digital or a hard copy, it should have your presence, your logo, your brand definition throughout. Because when people look at that and they say, oh, wow, not only have you taken the pain and the guesswork out of getting started with a new client with a new company, as, as we are as consultants, but they see this is somebody who goes the extra mile. This is somebody who pays attention to detail. And people are impressed with the fact that not only do you take care of business, but you're going to give that level of attention and detail to their business. So there's a great deal of comfort in that. And, and most people don't do it. It's a simple thing. Most people don't do it because you just kind of, you know, we do it piecemeal. Here's a part of it. Here's a part of it. Stop and put it all together. And people will really be impressed with the comprehensive level and the quality of care that you give your customers. Yeah, good tips, good tips. Okay, did we cover all seven? Uh, the next one is to collaborate. We think we do that, but we really need to build a level of trust and respect. And, and in my book, I have a, a, a story about a hospital, and they just did an amazing thing where they put all their differences on the table, and they were dealing with an interesting population. This is in New Mexico, a hospital where half of their po work population and patient population was Native American, mostly Navajo. The other half was either Caucasian and Hispanic, but more mainstream Christian. And they, and they were dealing with people's life and death, and they got into a lot of feelings about you know, how people wanted to be treated at the end of life. And they were able, through this deep level of collaboration, and I mean from the janitorial staff up to the neurosurgeons, 
talking to people over the course of a year about what their values were, how that should be perceived, how that should be stated, how they talk to patients. And then the interesting thing is then when they built a new wing in the hospital, they took all those values and all those beliefs into account and it worked into the actual architecture, the physical space and the layout of the building. And it's fascinating. The end result was if you were... If you were a patient and you had Christian or non-Navajo, non-Native American beliefs, you would walk into this gorgeous hospital wing and see these rounded corners and curved hallways. And in the corner of every, every, um, every corner of the building, the four corners, was this round chapel, which was really sort of a, a, a testament to the Hogan, which is the Native American, you know, their ritual round buildings that they used to live in. And some do, still do. But... To the Christian eye, it was, oh, this is lovely, it's a chapel. To the teachers or the trainers or the nursing staff, it was, this is a great place to do teaching and training. So they managed, and to the, to the Native American eye, it was a semblance, it was symbolic of the Hogan. So they were able, it was only because they did this deep discovery and collaboration where people felt very safe and very, very trusting that they were able to share these deeply held beliefs that don't always make their way to the workplace. So that's collaboration on the deepest sense and deepest level. And most of us just need to recognize that there are facts that we share. And then there's the sort of the untold, the unspoken emotional truths. And when we can get all of that out, we can collaborate on a level that is so deep and so honest. And when you're dealing with what people want to do with their lives and their careers, you want to get right down to where are you going? Why? Do, what's the why? What's the backstory? Why do you care so deeply? What difference do you hope to make in the world? And that's the stuff I care about. I mean, that's the stuff that gets me excited is finding out wh- where's that intersection between your passions as a human being and your goals as a professional. And when you can find that melding of the two, that's when magic happens in people's careers. Is it possible, Libby, that, I, I mean, if we have someone listening, and, you know, I've certainly struggled with it over over time at various points in my career, but I think I know that, I think I know that now. But there were times when I wondered about it, and I'm sure we all do. You know, you know, is it possible that maybe it's not a fit for some people or that they shouldn't be going down this road of thinking of this value proposition for branding themselves? Maybe they should be more product focused rather than personal brand focused. You know, I, I just have to sort of ask yeah. that. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think it depends on who you are and what you sell. But if we say it in the realm of speakers, authors, publishers, communicators, most of the people that you deal with in your world, Jason, if we're going to sell a product, whether it's a book or a DVD series or a widget, if we are, if it's coming from our heart and soul and our unique perspective, we've got to put some language and some meaning around that first. I think they've got to understand well, what do I do as a consultant? What do I do as a branding expert that's different than the next one or the next 20 or the next 2,000? Now, if you're talking about products that are commodities, if you're talking about I've got widget A and you've got widget A and we're selling the same thing, you know, then it often goes to price and availability and uh, customer service. I think that's a different proposition. But in the world where we are thought leaders and we're sharing messages and we're sharing information and ideas, I think it's critical to know, you know, what's the source? Where's the sort of the wellspring? Where does this come from for you? And it's, it's interesting because I know your background is real estate. But I, a lot of people in real estate or direct marketing or areas where they feel like, well, there's a, there's a mega brand. You know, I work for Century 21 or I work for this brokerage house or I work for um, Amway or whoever it is. And they feel like, well, that's the, that's the brand. And I disagree with that. I think that is absolutely the, the alpha brand. But you've got to brand yourself underneath that. You've got to explain, well, why am I the realtor that serves the tri-state area? Or why do I know everything about Arizona? And I don't know if you agree with that, but that's what I tell Oh, I, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I'll tell okay. you why I feel that way, Libby. I, I totally agree with you. Because people don't have relationships with logos, with yeah, buildings, with, with mission statements, companies. They have relationships with people. And that's why successful 
companies have usually successful personal brands. I mean, Lee Iacocca was probably the first one that did it with Chrysler. And then, you know, of course, there's a zillion of them today, most notably the late Steve Jobs, maybe. It's huge. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, it's, uh, they want to know the person, what makes them tick? How do they think? What are they like? I mean, that's, they can relate to that. I agree. And when I see a brand or a, a person who's a business owner who doesn't represent themselves on their own website, and there are some areas where there's confidentiality issues and all that sort of thing, and I understand that. But generally, I mean, even on a law firm or a financial services company, I want to know who's behind this company. What's your background? What's your picture? What do you look like? Where'd you go to school? You know, all those things are relevant to me. Not that anyone necessarily is the make or break or is why I'm going to uh, buy, but those are, I mean, this is really what my book is about. We make emotional connections. We think that we make all these logical decisions, but the truth is human beings feel first and we think second. And that's the, this whole subject that fascinates me because I'm a little bit of a, a science geek and I love to follow neuroscience studies and brain studies. And in the whole world of neuromarketing, now that we, you know, people, scientists can peek inside our brains with MRI scanners and those sorts of things, they can literally see, you know, what part of your brains are activated? You may think you like Pepsi, or you may think you like Coke, which is a more common response, but in fact, your brain lights up when you taste the Pepsi and not when you taste the Coke. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with the messages and what we believe. So as, as sellers, as purveyors of ideas and information, we've got to figure out What's the emotional link? How do I get right down to making that deep connection with people so that they trust me, so that they like me, so that they know enough about me to feel good? And because that's how we make our decisions. And we've heard that you've got to know, like, and trust them. But, you know, how do you get to that? And I think it's all this series of connective touch points. There's no bigger turnoff to me than uh, when I launched this book, I had a friend who'd done a very successful video series on a book launch. And I said, that's so cool. I want to know who did that and, and can I get in touch? And she gave me the name, which I won't say. I sent a message through their, their email, you know, website, didn't hear back. Sent a second one thinking, you know, everybody's got a glitch or two, didn't hear back. Picked up the phone and called them, didn't hear back. Now, I was so intrigued with what they had done for my colleague, I had her do an e-introduction for the two of us to the head of that company, and she did. And I got a nice email back saying, you know, I'm off to Hawaii, and I'll call you as soon as I get back on Monday. And do you think I ever heard from that company? Nope. At this point, it, they could drive into my driveway, come up to the front door with a gift, and I would—I I just wouldn't want to do business with them because it was like, well, either they don't need my business, they don't pay attention to detail, or they don't have their technical act together so that they, you know, they get their messages. That's not who I want servicing my business and my account. And everybody makes a slip. Everybody slips up. No, absolutely, no question. And those, in fact, even the big guys, you know, we'll all get a, a, a problem. And that's where what I call my goof, your gain comes into play. And that's a great branding opportunity. How do you correct a mistake? How do you jump on that and say, whoa, I really screwed that up. Let me over deliver. Let me give you something. I'm forever giving out, you know, books or I, I just spoke at an event and I, I had two workshops and the owner had turned the workshops around, the, the conference manager had turned the two workshops around because it just seemed like a better, and I knew that, I, but it, I didn't realize that a number of people were coming to hear the first one in a certain time period. And I thought, oh, I felt so bad. I gave them, I signed them all up for uh, a copy of my new book because, you know, I wanted them to walk away feeling great, not feeling like, well, they really messed up my day. And, you know, that's just go, it's very simple, not hard to do. I got their business card, got their address, and hooked them up with Amazon and sent them a copy. And that's our responsibility, and that's what the big branders do really well. And, they're, you know, there are all those urban legends about things that companies like Zappos have done, that Nordstrom has done to over-deliver when, uh, when they've made a mistake or when the customer perceives something has gone wrong. Sure, sure, absolutely. First of all, did we, was there anything else you wanted to cover on those steps? Because I want to ask you another question. Well, the last thing I have to mention is, you've, is contribute. You've always got to remember that your brand – who you are as a person, who you are as a professional. We are, we, we are here to serve. 
And I don't mean that in a demeaning way at all, but we're in business to take care of other people. And when you feel good about that and you feel like I'm in a – and, and I, frankly, I think everybody is in a service business. I can't think of a business that's not a service business. Uh, some are more obvious than others, but we're all I can, I can think of some. They have them in, I, in, the, in, in, in the few remaining communist countries. There are, quote, businesses, unquote, that are not in the service business. How do you like that? Oh, there are some that are not in service, but they should be, or theoretically. No, I understand what you're saying. But in what we do, you want to remember that you contribute. And there are things that you can do that are, that are beyond just understanding that I'm here to serve my customers. Contribute. Find a charity. Find something that really aligns with your brand that makes sense. People want to do business. And there are, again, studies to back this up. Most people, and there's a huge number, I think it's in my book, I think it's something like 75% of people want to do all things being equal. They would rather do business with a company that they perceive as one that cares, that gives back, that that supports a charity. And the closer to home and the more it hits their values, the more sense it makes to them. So there are lots of ways that we can contribute to our, not just our customers, but to our own communities where we live. Yeah, yeah, good points. You know, are there any, and, and this is probably not your area, but I just thought I'd ask you, are, are there any tools or technologies, uh, the, obviously social media is huge nowadays, but uh, any particular tips or, or tools that you, you want to mention to people that can help them branding? You talk a lot about the strategy, the philosophy behind it, and the, and those the, the, those important steps. But, you know, any any tools in particular? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a couple of tools that I think, and I'm always looking at how do we how do we stretch our marketing dollars? Because as you know, you can spend a fortune establishing a brand, or you can do it wisely in steps. And there are a couple of tools that I really like. And one is 99 Designs, and it's the number 99 99designs dot com. I had the founder and, on the show. He was great. Yeah. Oh, you did. Yeah, it's well. Then people have to go back and listen to that. I think it, that that's a company that delivers. You can absolutely get a great logo, website page, book cover, anything in terms of design from some really fine designers all over the world. You give them a little creative guidance, and boy, does it pay off. I'm a big fan of that. And the other one that I think is just terrific, and again, it hits on technology, is Elance.com, which is short for freelance. It's E-L-A-N-C-E.com. And you can find just about anything that can be done virtually from website design to SEO, which I know you've also talked about, all of these things, you can find people who do a great job of delivering these services at a great price. And it's set up with kind of an eBay system so that you're, you're, you see the rankings of their past jobs. They can see rankings of you as an employer. The money goes into an escrow. When the job is finished, they get paid. So even if you're dealing with somebody in a country where you don't, you know, they're far away, you never speak to them live, you're never on the phone together, you get satisfaction that's pretty well guaranteed. And I think those are great tools for entrepreneurs. The more we learn to do on our own, and, you know, I know just enough technology to be dangerous. I'm not a techie by any means, but I've learned to do what I what I can do for myself to run my own business. I don't think we need to have giant staff. So if we're in the, in the thought and content businesses, we need to be thinking and we need to be outsourcing for sure, but in, in cost-effective and simple ways. Yeah, no question about it. And nowadays, with the internet, that has empowered people more more than any other thing. A, a lot of this you can do yourself. You can live anywhere in the world you want to live. It's just a fantastic time, really. It really is. Well, what else do you want people to know uh, about building a brand? You know, maybe share, uh, if you have the time, uh, a little bit of your, your big corporate brand experience. And, and yeah, I'm sure people want to hear about Dr. Phil as well. Well, you know, it's interesting, and, and those two questions are sort of uh, go hand in hand because what happens in the in the corporate world where you're dealing with a brand, you've got a you've got a lot of marketing dollars, you've got you've got a lot of people generally, but it still comes down to individuals sitting around and thinking about strategies, positioning, 
the why behind the message. What are people going to care about? What's in it for them? All of those factors that anybody, even a solopreneur, has to has to think about. And when I launched the Dr. Phil show, I was actually the first one hired there. He was still on Oprah and was, was going off then to do his own show. And I was brought in as a consultant to uh, handle the PR and the brand launch. And there were a lot of working pieces. He had books and seminars and the show was coming on board. And it seems so simplistic now, but my goal was really at that time to to make him stand alone, you know, to make him a solo act because people had seen him for four years on the Oprah show sitting next to Oprah, but only people who were regular Oprah viewers. I needed to sell him to people that didn't know him and also to make it very clear that this was a guy who was going to do things differently in the talk show world and could really stand on his own and and be a different kind of host. And it was really about his education, his insights, this kind of straight talk. And again, it was the same sort of, it wasn't, and and then I had PR budgets and not marketing budgets. So it was not about the dollars spent, but it was about finding those moments of connection, finding those specific things that people can latch on to. And the first thing I did in launching Dr. Phil was I decided, well, we need to send a message that this isn't a People Magazine kind of guy. Nothing wrong with People Magazine. And ultimately he did all of those magazine interviews and cover stories and all that kind of stuff that celebrities do. But initially, I thought, no, we've got to be Time Magazine or Newsweek. We want to be on one of those covers. And we landed the cover of Newsweek the week the show premiered. And my thought was, we want to send a message that this is a different kind of show, a different kind of host. It's really about bringing therapy to people that can't afford it, won't seek it out, don't understand it, and at that high level. And um, and that's what we did, and it really set him apart. Now, that's the kind of thing that if you're in the world of public relations, you want it to appear as if it happened overnight. And of course, it took months to orchestrate all the behind-the-scenes interviews and things that go on. But it was a way to really separate and set a tone from the start. Yeah, fantastic. I uh, you were you were the person who really uh, it was the, was the first person who made all that happen for him. Oh, wow, that's, a, that's yeah, amazing. Although I got to say, yeah. he did just fine on his own. Well, he's of course, been, of course, but... he's been doing fine. But it was it was setting that initial tone and and making sure you know you, you get yourself on the map. And it's the same for any of us. What is that one message that we really want people to remember? If you've got, if you get, and it's the same with our website. What is that clarity of message? What's the call to action? So it's what do you have to say? What's your message? And then what do you want people to do? Yeah. Do you want them to pick up the phone? Do you want them to read your testimonial page? Do you want them to go to your audio podcast, which of course is what I do with your page, Jason? I go back and flip through and see all the great interviews, and you, you find something right when you need it. And there's great information out there if we do our homework, but it's really about your value proposition, who you talk to, and and who your podcast, who your services are for is really clear. You state it right up front. And that's what you want people to understand and to remember about you. Yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic advice. Your website is LibbyGill.com. That's LibbyGill.com. And Libby, you have an ebook offer, I believe, too, right? I do. And if people want to just email me at Libby at LibbyGill.com or just if you can't remember that, just go to my website. You'll find it on the contact page. And just let me know you want my ebook. Just put ebook in the subject line or just send me a message. I love to hear from people. And I answer all my emails. And I will send them the 10 stupid things people do to mess up their websites and how to fix or avoid them. And it's really 10 concrete things. And two, I just mentioned, do you have a clear message on your homepage? And is there a call to action so people know what you want them to do? But I've got another, what would that be, eight of them. So just send me an email and I'll send that out to you. Fantastic. Well, Libby Gill, thanks so much for joining us today. And best of luck with your book. Uh, Again, the book title, everybody can check it out on Amazon. It just went up today. Capture the mind share and the market share will follow the art and science of building brands. Libby, that is a fantastic title, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Well, hey, keep up the good work and happy branding. Thanks. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Glad to share with your audience, Jason. I've never really thought of Jason as subversive, but I just found out that's what Wall Street considers him to be. Really? Now, how is that possible at all? Simple. Wall Street believes that real estate investors are dangerous to their schemes because the dirty truth about income property is that it actually works in real life. 
I know. I mean, how many people do you know, not including insiders, who created wealth with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds? Those options are for people who only want to pretend they're getting ahead. Stocks and other non-direct traded assets are a losing game for most people. The typical scenario is you make a little, you lose a little, and spin your wheels for decades. That's because the corporate crooks running the stock and bond investing game will always see to it that they win. This means, unless you're one of them, you will not win. And unluckily for Wall Street, Jason has a unique ability to make the everyday person understand investing the way it should be. He shows them a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Yep, and that's why Jason offers a one-book set on creating wealth that comes with 20 digital download audios. He shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches you how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And this set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered for only $197. To get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia Book 1, complete with over 20 hours of audio, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Dot com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.